Hi folks, so we're going to talk about um, malware behavior um, in terms of doing reverse engineering and malware analysis. So kind of the characteristics of the um, things to look for when you're doing malware analysis. And it can help you to identify malware and also just to be aware of while you're doing the analysis. Um, essentially, you know, obviously what we're interested in is just any malicious behavior. And it's not always easy to define what malicious behavior is for software because what might be a benign action like deleting a file could also be a malicious action like deleting a file when the user doesn't expect it to be deleted. So there's, um, you know, the context is important, the, um, what you expect the software to be doing is important. Um, but beyond that, there's also some common behaviors and patterns that you can see in system calls and like API functions and things in Windows and Linux that you'll see in malware. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, both Windows and Linux because actually it's not that different. Um, and I'll try and give some examples from each. Um, I'm going to record a separate demo video, which will focus on the Linux side. Um, and I will um, demo how to the um, like DLL or um, SO uh, injection um, looks like on, on Linux, for example, and also um, some like packers and things like that. So I'll record one or more videos um, separate to this. So, <clears throat> so one of the things that is a common behavior is uh, like downloads and downloaders and, and launches where basically you get some software that downloads some malware off the internet and runs it. So, um, you know, things that might, you know, so it's fairly straightforward on a Windows system. You'll see the Windows API they used to um, URL download file, uh, and then it will execute that using WinExec or create process or shell execute. They're all different ways of uh, executing a program. Uh, on Linux, uh, you'll see usually something like libcurl um, being linked to, um, that by itself tells you that it's um, likely to download stuff off the internet, uh, but it might um, call one of the curl functions, like curl easy perform, and then it will call system or one of the exec family of functions to actually run the program. So there's a, a bunch of different um, standard C library um, functions that have similar names that start with exec, and they will start a, start a um, process. And... Um, so, you know, if you see any of those, then um, you'll um, give a, have a pretty good indication it's running a program. And if it's just, if that was following a, a file download, then that's you know, something to, to look at, try and figure out what file it downloaded for a start um, that was executed. So, <clears throat> Backdoors are another common behavior where a um, where the malware wants a way to give an, an attacker remote access to the system, uh, and it might be either by just shoveling a shell at them, so giving them shell access, or it might be a more complete set of uh, functionality, so d different commands that it responds to to do different things. Um, there's the idea of a bind shell or a reverse shell, if you're not already familiar. The difference is a bind shell is it just listens on a port and when something connects to that port it hands over a shell uh, or alternatively reverse shell is where um, the software is trying to connect out of the system and therefore bypass incoming firewalls and get past you know uh, potentially routing issues or you know if we've got using a NAT of network um, an outgoing connection will be more straightforward um, you'll see some network binding of some kind. So um, if you look at the raw like system calls that are used, you'll see the networking behavior happening within the function. Uh, and so the, that might be done in one of two different ways when you're doing the malware analysis. You might see it, the system calls happening directly within the program. So for example, in a statically compiled piece of malware, or you might see a dynamically linked um, function being called, like a network related function being called. Uh, in terms of, um, w you know, to see a shell happening, if you see a shell being directly executed, 
So the command program, CMD on Windows or PowerShell, shells basically, if they're being directly run in, an, in like an interactive kind of way and attached to a network, then obviously that's suspicious. Or if you see bash or um, shell, like bin slash sh, which might, may or may not be just a link to bash or whatever, Z shell, uh, if they're executed directly using exec or system, um, then that's another um, red flag that you might be looking at the back door. And there are a few different categories, you know, there's a separate video I recorded about categories of malware that goes into more of the different ways you can categorize malware, but the behavior is similar across things like a, a rat or a botnet. So the difference is like a remote access trojan or remote admin tool is basically it's a um, piece of malware that you would use in a targeted attack. You send it to someone or get it running on some the attacker sends it to someone, gets it running on their system, and then um, you know connect to it or send commands to that system. A botnet is basically the same thing except you're talking about lots of systems. So there might be hundred thousand systems that are all on the same botnet and they've been infected in various ways and now they're all part of the one collective and there's like one um, person or you know bot master or whatever that can send commands and they get sent or to or the commands are received retrieved from all of those um, zombies in the botnet or all those bots uh, and then it will you know but other than that they're quite similar because um, so usually they'll have like a list of commands that they accept um, you'll see usually if they're trying to if they're connecting out they'll go out on port 80 or 443 because that's where most firewalls will let them um, the least likely to meet resistance or to look suspicious um, one of the things you can look out for is if it's um, on those um, ports, but it's not HTTP traffic, so it's just like actually a, just a direct TCP connection with some other stuff going on, uh, and so that might be detected using um, things like um, Zeek um, intrusion detection system and things like that, where you can detect non-standard things happening on ports. But you know, usually malware malware authors are trying hard to not not look suspicious so you know they could still make the traffic look like actual http traffic um if there is an in, if it uses an incoming port it might use a quite a high port number um or it will just be on like port 80 or whatever like the, it's um the old netbus trojan from the 90s was on port 12345 um but that's not that common um in terms of like what Trojans will usually do. Um, life was simpler in the 90s. We didn't have network um, address translation, so almost every single PC had their own IP address, and so a Trojan would literally just just listen on a port and follow the commands that it got sent. Uh, and now um, networking has you know moved on from that slightly, um, and so yeah, you'll you'll see it behaving a little bit differently. But the, the idea is still similar. Um, and so that you'll have a, the Trojan horse will usually have a server component, which is the thing that gets run on the, the, on the victim's computer. And then when it receives a command, um, it will run it. And if we're talking about a bot, then it will um, basically phone into like a command and control center. And then it will, all the bots will call in and run the same command often. Um, or if they're being more advanced, it'll be like a peer-to-peer -peer network to make it harder to take the bot offline and the botnet offline. Um, another common behavior you'll see is credential stealing or hash dumping. And basically, attackers want to know your passwords because uh, it's helpful. Uh, they might just still get something out of having a hash, like being able to do pass the hash attacks and things like that. Or if they get a password hash, they can do offline um, cracking to try and get your actual password out of the hash. So, you know, as you'll be aware, like um, the um, passwords are usually stored in a hashed format on a computer, um, not in the clear. So when an attacker gets that, they can then try and crack that password. Um, and so ways they can get it is on a Windows system, they can use DLL injection, talk about it in a minute, on um, LSASS. Um, and the, and if they use the um, the SAM server DLL, they, there's, there's a, um, they can use the APIs that are on the slide there. 
to you know if you see those happening then there's a, you know there's a chance that they're trying to dump the um, the SAM database which is where the hashes are stored on a Windows system uh, on a Linux system it's a, they just have to access the shadow file which has the hashed passwords in it uh, normally only roots allowed to uh, should only be allowed to access that file um, but you know once the malware is on your system um, if it's running as root for example it will access that file and get that information um, other thing you might see malware doing is monitoring the clipboard or browse, web browser internals for things like uh, you know passwords being copied and pasted or typed or um, you know web browsers with you know credit card details and, and the rest of it. So if they are um, the other thing they'll do is monitor the keystrokes. So on a Windows system, one way to do that or a common way to do that is to you'll see get foreground window followed by get async key state for each of the keys on the keyboard and there's some common strings that if you see these strings here in um, in this in the um, software so if you if you pass for those strings in the malware then that's a indication it could be um, using the uh, using that API for um, reading keystrokes um, on Linux, there's a there's a file for everything, and there's a file that represents the device or the keyboard. And if you're privileged, if you have the appropriate privilege level, you can listen, you can read that file, and it will feed you all the keystrokes that are happening. Um, and so that's the user space um, equivalent. If you're in the kernel, then obviously you can read the keyboard um, in other way, lots of other ways. Um, another thing malware will, will want to do is go for persistence, so it wants to stick around when you are, um, uh, you know, restart your computer. The malware still wants to be there, so it needs some way to continue to run each time. There's actually loads of different ways that this can happen. Um, the lowest tech way, I guess, on Windows is there's there's a bunch of registry entries of, that just lists all of the commands that get run when the computer starts, so you can just dump it into there. Um, this is not quite showing on the slide there, but it's like current user slash run. Um, and there's a few of those places. Um, and on Linux, there's lots of different places where you could put, the, there's quite a few scripts that run while the system is booting up, so there's lots of opportunities to basically um, hide something in there that starts up a process. Um, maybe with an entirely new service, or just monitor, you know, editing an existing service. Um, you can um, also per user when a user logs in every time. There's uh, the profile and the bash rc scripts get run, um, and so you, you know, the commands could be in there. Um, that's on a, like a bash-based Linux system, as most are, um, and. Um, another way of persisting is by tro trojanizing system binaries, and obviously that's a way that rootkits work. Is for some kind well, user space rootkits work by replacing the executables that are on the disk. So, for example, they replace the ps command that normally lists processes with a version that um, you know doesn't list all the processes, so it can hide the presence of other malware that's running on the system. Um, but also, if trojanized um, binaries gives it a way of um, obviously starting when a computer starts if there are things that get run um, you know as part of the of the boot process um, and another way of getting persistence is through DLL um, loading order or injection so there's a number of locations where DLLs and um, shared object files are stored on Windows and Linux respectively um, and if we can um, make the shared libraries malicious, then we can change the behavior of the software on our system. So, um, if we can get the um, code to run within the memory of another process, um, then we can actually change the behavior of the software, so change what it's doing. We can access the sensitive information that's in, in memory, like passwords or, um, you know, we can do all kinds of things, like ch change the behavior of the software completely um, whenever they call um, the, the library, or in the case of Linux or on Windows, you can just get it to run arbitrary code as soon as it's loaded. Um, and so there's, um, and that's what happens with DLL injection, and 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about that because it's quite interesting. So and and as a, co a common um, as part of a tax. So DLL injection on Windows. But so broadly, there's two ways you can inject uh, DLLs: is by the lo loading order or by injecting into a running process. So in terms of the loading order on Windows, there's there's a couple of places like app init DLLs and app cert DLLs that basically they list places to look for DLLs and um, load them into pretty much every process. So app init DLLs get loaded in every process that loads you use a 32 DLL file. Uh, on Windows 7, um, it requires a signature on those DLLs, um, and you can't do it when you're using Secure Boot. Um, with app cert DLLs, they get loaded into every process that calls the um, create process function. So that's like a lot. So if you can get your DLL listed there, then your um, malicious code gets loaded into like lots of programs when they when they, whenever they start. Um, on Linux, uh, there's an environment variable called ld preload, and in that environment variable, you can list shared objects.so files. It's like the equivalent of DLL files on Linux, and um, they load will load before any other library, and it will, can overwrite any of those shared functions. So, for example, you could um, like overwrite the rand function um, so that a um, program that tries to create a random number using you know, a, a shared library that generates random numbers, you can tell it what number to use, which could be um, could mean that you could break the encryption that they're using, for example. Um, but it doesn't stop there. You can change the behavior of any of those functions and add whatever behavior you want to the software. As soon as those functions are called, your software can, you know, your malware will do those things, which can include changing the behavior of the existing software um, and um, yeah, changing the behavior to whatever you want as an attacker. Um, the, the other kind of DLL injection is force, forcing the DLLs into another process. So there's a process that's already running on the system and the malware is running on the system and it wants to insert itself into the other process. And in, on, on Windows you can do that by calling create remote thread X and then load library. And when that happens, on Windows it will trigger a DLL to be loaded and the DLL has a main function, DLL main, which gets called. Uh, and a lot of um, like DLL injection will just have that main function, will have the, the bad stuff in it, and it will do that. Um, and, uh, and that code's running with the, pro with the privilege of that target process that you've just injected into. So, um, the, even if you're on a um, normal system and you can, um, you've got a certain level of privilege, like an admin level of privilege or a user level of privilege, there still might be different restrictions placed on different processes. Um, for example, there might be firewall on Windows, so there might be a per process firewall rule, which you can sidestep by inserting into a different process. And also it makes malware uh, analysis harder if you, the malware is running within another process, and also it's less likely to be detected as being um, suspicious if it's a process that's always there uh, on a Windows system, for example. And that's why you see a lot of malware will, run, will inject itself into things like um, CVC host. Um, so direct injection is basically the same thing, except that rather than loading a library file, like a DLL file or a SO file, it will actually inject the shellcode directly like into a running process and execute it within that process. Um, it's more tricky um, to do it in a way that doesn't impact the original um, code flow, um, and you know, not um, you know, try and avoid the pro program from crashing or tripping up the security mechanisms that detect those sorts of changes. Um, so, uh, uh, like another kind of shortcut method related to that is that you can just replace the entire memory with your own code. So you can start start a process off. So for example, you could start off a, a normal um, executable program that's always there and suspend it as it starts so that it's not running. And re remove all the contents, scoop it all out of there and, and then put your own malware in there and then, um, and then let it run. And then that way you've got uh, a 
executable that looks like it's come from a standard like normal executable on disk but actually what's running in memory is something that's malicious. Um, and on Windows there is a privilege called SA debug privilege and it is just by itself as a red flag that uh, because it's like super um, powerful in its ability to do these kinds of things. So any program that has that can access the memory of other processes and, and inject code. So here's an example of how um, actually the meterpreter um, payload works is it uses open process which gives it access to the memory of another program is so how it can migrate from one program to another uh, then it uses virtual alloc um, to allocate um, some read write execute memory in that process and then use write process memory to actually write the payload into it and then you create the remote thread using that and, um, and then you've got it running. Um, so any process that enables that privilege is a red flag um, and you need local admin rights in order to do that, um, which on a lot of people's like home PCs and things, there will be local admin of their own system. So, um, you know, if you see that happening, then it's a, it's a red flag. Um, and a process calling create remote thread is, is also interesting um, and it could be related to, you know, doing the DLL injection. So the, the other thing that malware will try to do is to look different, so to, to um, avoid being detected. So, you know, malware authors want to uh, have different versions of, them, of the same malware so that it gets past um, anti-malware. So um, an executable packer will basically um, compress the code um, into an executable that when it runs it decompresses um, while it runs. So there's um, packers are not just used for malicious purposes, they're used even if you just want to release some software. Uh, it just makes the executables smaller so they're not specific to malware but they're used extensively by malware so that they end up you know being different because it modifies the signature. So you know, the most common packer is um, the ultimate packer for executables, UPX, which is a um, GPL uh, licensed open source packer, and it works on Windows and Linux and Mac. Um, and other packers will include like encryption, so that you can, or if you use any packer, it will mask strings from being detected from a um, static analysis. Um, and encryption in particular will hide it and make reverse engineering more difficult. Um, Anti-malware typically will automatically strip away packers, like ones that it can automatically detect, um, so that it can get at what's inside before it does the analysis. And often you'll actually have multiple layers of packers used. And you can use, um, you can have hidden payloads within malware, so where you've got code encryption and obfuscation. Um, and the code itself might include a decryption function so that it can run the code that's encrypted. Uh, you've got polymorphic code, which is where the stored code changes each time. So that's like if you used a different packer it, uh, or created some difference to the way that you're packing it each time, you can end up with a different version of the source code that even when it, once it unpacks and runs, it's the same code running. Whereas metamorphic code is where the actual executed code changes. Um, and so the actual code that's running in memory might change. And it could do that by using different instructions, um, like lots of NOPs. Like a NOP instruction is a CPU instruction that does like nothing. It's a not, not, like a no operation function. But there's also, you just could call a bunch of um, uh, meaningless things that swap around the contents of registers and things that don't actually affect the, the actual behavior of the software. Um, so yeah, you can do that. And um, you know, it might just reorder the commands, uh, add extra loops and things like that so that the software keeps looking a bit different each time. Um, and some of the other common behaviors that you might see is trying to detect the presence of anti-malware. Um, so that might be like looking at um, looking for emulation, um, looking for any kind of debugging. So if it, it detects that you're attaching to the process, to you know detect that, um, looking for 
um, VM that it's running within a virtual environment. Um, nowadays, a lot of stuff happens in VMs, like a lot of servers and things, but if it thinks it's on a home computer and it, it's in a VM, then it will stop or just like never run in a VM because it's more likely that someone's trying to analyze me and understand how the malware works. Um, sandbox detection, similar thing, monitoring detection, um, and you know that an antivirus software is running. All those are things that, if you just even if you can see that the malware is looking for those things, that in and of itself is a red flag that you've got some malware on your hands. Um, and just generally generating obfuscated or encrypted code, um, and what that means is your code ends up being a high entropy. So if you analyze a binary and it has really high entropy, um, so there's like a lot of randomness to the data, and then that's a sign that maybe it's um, got a packer involved or it's got encryption on it, which is a bit of a red flag that you need, could investigate a bit further. So <clears throat> in conclusion, there's lots of common, common behavior that we find in malware. Uh, it really helps to be aware of these things um, and you will become familiar when you start analyzing malware. Uh, but there are legitimate reasons to call many of these same functions. Um, and malware will try and evade detection and try and make your life difficult if you're trying to analyze it. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind.